Is it possible and have you got examples of emerging market multinationals who have actually been successful in the major developed country markets such as the US or Europe, uh, Australia, Japan, etc.? A big cement producer, construction material producer from Mexico, they basically in the 1980s decided to concentrate on only in construction and start expanding abroad. The first country they moved out was into the US. They didn't have good communications, they established a satellite system. They didn't have a good distribution system. They established their own delivery of cement to uh, clients. They basically had to do things internal, internalize much of what we take for granted in advanced economies. They came to the US, then at one point they were basically the third largest cement company. Hello, and welcome to International Business Today. As you know, in this series, we discuss uh, important current issues in international business based on current uh, academic research, as well as deep experiences of practitioners. Our guest today is uh, Professor Alvaro Cuervo Casura from the Demora McKim School of Business, and he'll be talking to us about emerging market multinationals. Uh, Professor Alvaro has a PhD from MIT. He has taught at Cornell at uh, University of uh, Minnesota in Minneapolis, and he has been at Northeastern at the Demora McKim School uh, since about 2011, so over a decade. Uh, he's a very accomplished scholar. He's written six books, uh, probably 60 to 70 articles by now, uh, 30 or 40 book chapters. Uh, he's one of the most uh, well-known scholars uh, in the international business world. He's the co-editor of the Global uh, Business Strategy uh, Journal, and he has an honorary doctorate from uh, Copenhagen, and uh, he's on the editorial board of the Academy of Management Review, the Academy of Management Journal, uh, Journal of International Business Studies. So, <laughs> Alvaro, it is a pleasure to have you here and to uh, hear about your deep knowledge and expertise on emerging market multinationals. Let's start with a very fundamental question. Why do we need to talk separately about emerging market multinationals? Why do you think we need a concept called emerging market multinationals? Well, Ravi, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here uh, to talk about emerging market multinationals. There are important new, to some extent, new concept in the sense that we have a lot of knowledge about multinationals. These tend to be the best companies in the country. They tend to internationalize thanks to the abilities they develop in their home country. Much of the theory and uh, many of the examples we have in mind tend to be companies from advanced economies. We assume to be leading companies, large companies, well-established. Their brands are uh, pretty much well-known. They have gone out and have been dominating the, the global economy for a long time. All of a sudden, in the 1990s and especially in the 2000s, what we have is a new group of companies coming from emerging economies that they start going out. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a big surprise. Why? Because look, and these are developing countries and they should not be because they are developing countries uh, generating companies that are internationally competitive. In some cases, companies that have sophisticated innovation, sophisticated capabilities, and that basically created this idea that, well, this is not what we predict will be happening. Uh, these countries should develop first, and then once they have developed, their companies can go out, and all of a sudden, even though they were not developed, they basically generated lots of companies that became highly sophisticated competitors against well-established companies from advanced economies. Good. And that was a big surprise for many of us. So let me ask you, it is very hard to do international business to go into new new countries which you don't know very well, where there's established competitors, where the ground rules are different. So how do these emerging market companies actually go about developing their international business? One of the ideas uh, or the logic behind them is uh, to some extent a dual logic. Why do we want to go out? Well, because there are better opportunities, there is a new market, we are really good at understanding what happens in emerging economies, why don't we go to other emerging economies? We have products that target the consumers here, hey, consumers there are similar, why don't we go and basically sell to them? So that's one, if you want, traditional argument that the products are designed to address the needs of consumers in emerging economies, therefore they can go to their emerging economies. 
The surprise came when all of a sudden they were coming to advance economies. And that was here the story that, well, are they coming here because they have something new to offer or is it that they are just coming here to buy technologies, to buy brands they were lacking? Initially, some of the entry and especially through acquisitions was we are really good, we are understand emerging economies, we lack some technological sophistication, our brands might not be well known abroad, why don't we go to advanced economies and buy some of those? And it was a notion that, well, they are just coming here to buy, they are just trying to get technology or more sophisticated marketing, some skills, bring them back home. Yes. Then they changed. And then all of a sudden, it's not just let's buy technologies, but let's bring the products we have created at home and start selling them in advanced economies. And that was kind of, a, well, these are much more sophisticated than we thought. Mm -hmm, it's not, mm -hmm. yes, they are coming from emerging economies. They are not quite as good. Some of them are really good. All of a sudden, there is this conundrum that how do we deal with these new competitors? I see that that all companies have to worry about competition, and especially if you have new challenging competitors emerging from these relatively unknown countries, it can cause managers to wonder how to proceed. Uh, now, you've been researching and writing about emerging market multinationals for at least 10 years. And during 10 years, a lot of changes have taken place. So in what ways has your research changed our understanding and perhaps a deeper appreciation of their competitive abilities? Mm -hmm. Initially, well, it's on the yeah. one hand, it's more. It's been more than ten years uh, mm -hmm. since I've been working on this. So, to some extent, I started in the early two thousands, uh, trying to understand these companies. And at the time, uh, much of the conversations were about, well, what do the companies have that is different? Well, they are coming from emerging economies. They are relying on factors of production. The labor costs tend to be much lower in terms of cost. And in some cases, they are highly sophisticated. Maybe they, many of them have some government support. Access to natural resources seems to be easier for them because they are at home. And they can basically build on the advantages of the home country and then go out. This was, to some extent, the initial th thinking about these companies. But then we realized, yes, that might be OK for exporting. You rely on the location advantage of your home country, you build new products, and then you start sending them out. Many of them did that as part of global supply chains of uh, advanced company multinationals. But then they started investing abroad. And then all of a sudden, well, how is it that they are able to invest abroad and start new operations, enter countries that are more advanced with new products, new processes, and then all of a sudden we started thinking, let's go deep into what they do rather than the access to the location advantage. And we basically started understanding that, no, it is the production process. It is the process innovation that drives many of their ability to go out. Process innovation that we didn't think it was possible to do. Uh, they focus really on efficiency and they focus on trying to understand how to do things better, even though the countries were not supportive of their international expansion, especially in technology. And then they started going out in areas that we were not expecting. And all of a sudden, our thinking changed that, look, it's not just they happen to be coming from emerging economies. If we go to emerging economies and start operating there, we are going to have the same advantage. No, they are doing things differently. They are basically challenging our understanding of production processes, our understanding of business models. They are focusing on things that are different and that enable them to go out. And that basically has now been the realization that no, it's not just an emerging market story that they rely, they rely on the location advantage. It's more of an internal process story, they are doing things differently, business models, business model innovation, process innovation that enables them to basically go out. You know, in strategy, we often talk about dynamic capabilities. That is, over time, companies acquire new ways to differentiate themselves and continue or deepen their uh, sustainable competitive advantage. So do you want to talk a little bit about that aspect of differentiation and competitive advantage of these emerging market multinationals? Talking about dynamic capabilities in emerging market multinationals is really interesting because this is something that these companies have developed very well. A lot of it has to do with all the variation that you see in emerging economies. There is a lot of uncertainty. 
economy can do very well today, and then all of a sudden there is a crisis, and then tomorrow it's doing well again. The political system might have through, go through many changes. Society is also growing through lots of changes. They are really used to basically adapting to changes. And it's part of, if you want the ethos of managers, that look, you cannot take things for granted. There is going to be variation, there is going to be crisis that enables them to be much more flexible. It leads them to have much more uh, quick decision making. There is much less, uh, let's wait and do a big analysis. A lot of it is, we understand how to operate with lots of changes. We can go and basically start making those uh, transformations. And as a result, when they go out, they basically come with this idea that, yes, uh, we may not have everything fully analyzed, but uh, we do understand how to adapt. We have the flexibility. We can basically get into trying to understand things as we go along. And as a result, they have gone out and they have gone out very quickly and very broadly, which is some of the, if you want, uh, new characteristics of these companies in comparison to the traditional internationalization processes of advanced economy multinationals, which tend to be much more organic. Let's analyze it well. Let's analyze mm -hmm. what's going to happen in the country. How do we enter? Enter slowly. Try to get a sense, a feel for the country. And then we'll go much deeper and commit more resources, commit to production, commit to basically more people. Is this idea of Dynamism in, at home, it happens, it's always there. So you develop this ability to basically be flexible and basically take risk and then go out very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be great if you could give us some examples, mm -hmm. perhaps one or two multinationals that in your estimation have actually implemented these concepts uh, that you've been describing. Um, we, at this point, we know very well of the large, if you want, uh, multinationals from emerging economies. Some of them are leading companies uh, from China, Huawei in technology, from Brazil, uh, and JBS in meat production. Uh, but there are, the interesting part, I think, is not looking at the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. Because to some extent, uh, if you're running a company, you already have identified them. The interesting part, I think, is looking at mid-sized companies, mid-sized multinationals, early multinationals, how did they go out? Uh, a nice example is uh, Pharmacia Similares. Uh, it's coming similares? From, uh, similares. Okay. It's coming from Mexico. Uh, it started, uh, initially, it was just a producer of generic drugs. And it was selling to uh, the national uh, healthcare system. Then they happened to lose the contract. And it's kind of, well, what do you do when your main single buyer is no longer buying from you. So then they decided, OK, why don't we just start uh, creating our pharmacies and basically establish a, a delivery, a distribution? They started with a, a really interesting ad idea, which was, look, we are in Mexico. Healthcare system is not well developed. A lot of the population uh, works in the formal economy. They don't have access to in medical insurance. Uh, many of them are self-medicating. Uh, if we can basically target this market because they have relatively low income, we are going to provide good products at a lower price. So they started targeting this market and then they realized, yes, this is good. However, uh, these people don't have access to a doctor. So that means that they cannot basically choose the right uh, medicine. So they decided let's expand it into, in addition to having the pharmacy next to it, we are going to basically have a small uh, medical uh, consultancy so that you can come to the doctor, you pay very little, to $3, you get a prescription, with that you go to the pharmacy, you get your low cost uh, medicine. That was the business model that was basically adapting very quickly to the need of a country, and then they basically took it to the rest of Latin America. And it was, look, the same needs that we have in Mexico, Guatemala has a similar need, Chile has one, Argentina has one, and they started implementing the same idea that there is a very large segment of a population, it is underserved. We have created a new business model. It's not a new, big, new, high innovative product. It is just a business model in which you take generic medicines, you take a doctor, put them nice one next to the other, and you serve the needs of a very large segment of the population. And from there, they have basically gone out throughout Latin America. It works well. In some countries, they had more success. 
in others less, which is typical of what happens with internationalization. But the notion here is uh, understanding that they are coming with new business models uh, because they do understand the home country very well, because they are flexible and they adapt to the needs and they are basically adjusting as they go along. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like an emerging market multinational can expand overseas by going into other emerging markets that are similar to its home country. Is it possible and have you got examples of emerging market multinationals who have actually been successful in the major developed country markets such as the US or Europe, uh, Australia, Japan, etc.? In other words, inroads into advanced mm -hmm. developed countries. Uh, many of them. Uh, and for the most part, what happens with these companies that we don't really know much about them, partly because they tend to focus on industrial products. Industrial Cemex, products. Uh -huh. which is the typical example. Uh, it's a big cement producer, construction material producer from Mexico. They basically, in the 1980s, decided to concentrate on only on construction and start expanding abroad. The first country they moved out was into the U.S., why the U.S.? Well, because they were export exporting from the northern uh, side of Mexico and then they faced tariffs. So then they decided we know how to make cement very well. We are really efficient. We can produce cement in the U.S. as well and we can also be as efficient. So they had developed efficiency internally and that was partly as a result of the lack of support of the environment. They didn't have good communications. They established a sat satellite system. They didn't have a good distribution system. They established their own delivery of cement to uh, clients. They basically had to do things internally, internalize much of what we take for granted in advanced economies. They came to the US, then at one point, they were basically the third largest cement company. Bimbo, which is another Mexican company, it is, depending on how you measure it, uh, the second or the first uh, largest uh, bakery in the world. They mm -hmm. operate in the US. Uh, they bought Sara Lee and they took the production system into the U.S. It's an idea that they mm -hmm. understand production very well. They go out, they expand because they do understand how to produce things. Brands, less of a, less of, if you want, a, mm -hmm. an ability to take them out. Some cases, yes, Huawei, uh, not in the U.S. because of uh, government regulations, but it basically operates uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, Thai Union, which is the biggest producer of uh, seafood in the world. Thai Union? Yes. Okay. The Thai Union Group, they bought uh, Chicken of the Sea and they operate here. The production system, they take it from Thailand, they operate in Thailand, but also they basically enter and the idea of entering through the acquisition of France is that because it accelerates the uh, expansion into advanced economies. Okay. Now, the starting point of all of these emerging market multinationals is the home market. Yes. Cemex, for example, first became mm -hmm. dominant in Mexico. To do that, you have to contend with a lot of uh, backwardness, if I can use that word, mm -hmm. both in terms of market imperfections as well as government imperfections, corruption possibly, lack of infrastructure, roads, and uh, so on, and energy supply. And in doing so, they are able to become more profitable and get financial uh, performance. But in, in solving the difficulties of the domestic market, do they also improve the societies that they're part of? In other words, do they not only do well, but do they also do good in some ways? They do. Uh, and partly this is uh, this notion that you are in countries that are less developed. You cannot rely on the government for many of the public uh, mm -hmm resources that we take for granted here. We take for granted that the government is going to take care of infrastructure, it's going to invest in education, it's going to provide healthcare, it's going to provide a general infrastructure, it's also going to provide uh, good supporting institutions. Many of this is not mm -hmm. working as well in emerging economies. The result is that you have to internalize that to basically operate. This is a long story. Uh, for example, Bimbo, the, the example mm -hmm. we were discussing before, uh, Cemex, uh, other not only Mexican companies, but Brazilian companies, early on they were providing healthcare for the employees. Why? Because you couldn't have employees go to a public hospital because the hospital wasn't developed enough. In some cases they were providing housing. In other cases they were also providing education. The notion is that you need in some occasions to basically compensate for 
the lack of infrastructure. You are the one who is going to develop uh, and build a road. Yes, that enables you to access your production plant. That same road enables people in the nearby mm -hmm. uh, area. All of a sudden have a much better access road. All of a sudden you have uh, electricity in your production plant. You are going to, to some extent, provide electricity to the area. The notion that you have to basically uh, support the local community is because you have to provide that because in some cases the government cannot. In other cases, the notion is, well, there is also market imperfections. You cannot really govern well. As a result, you tend to internalize suppliers. You tend to work much tighter with them rather than rely on them because maybe the contracts are not working that well. The result of this is that we end up with another type of uh, organization that is typical of emerging economies, which are business groups we just have highly diversified operations in lots of different businesses because you need to basically enter supporting industries because you cannot rely well on those suppliers the result is that what we see in emerging economies is companies that don't really make much sense mm. for mm. the characteristics of advanced economies and companies that have then done a lot of investment in especially the social infrastructure what we now call a uh, social responsibility for a long time because it was something that they needed to do to operate. So there's a lot of interest uh, and has been for some time in ESG, right? ESG is about social and governance as well as you know, environmental issues. And it sounds to me from listening to you that these multinationals have achieved a certain level of uh, uh, success in uh, economically developing their countries and also in creating jobs and thus uh, doing p poverty alleviation. So if that is correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but if that is correct, what can we learn from these emerging market multinationals about this broad field of ESG? Um, the notion here is we tend to see, and it has changed mm -hmm. how we see ESG. Initially, it was ethics and corporate social mm -hmm. responsibility, and it was mostly uh, an idea that, well, we need to support the social contract with mm -hmm. stakeholders and therefore we are going to give some money to local communities. It was seen more of a donation than anything else. Philanthropy. Yes. Uh -huh. Now it has changed into this is not just giving some money away. Mm -hmm. Why don't we introduce this as part of the way we do things? And this is a change in the logic, not only in emerging economies, but also in advanced countries. The difference in emerging economies is that this idea was not there, but they were nevertheless doing it. You had to invest in providing healthcare to the local community or education or water or electricity as basically your way to operate in that area. It was expected of you that you will be doing these things. Fast forward this, now you integrate this into the way you do business and you integrate the notion that we are not just making money, we are also helping develop the country because that builds a lot of reputation. It builds a lot of goodwill with not only your employees, it's also with the consumers, it's also with the local governments. That helps you basically operate better. And the difference to some extent between emerging and advanced economies is that most of the emerging economy multinationals and big companies, they tend to focus more on the social side. Part of this is because we do have limitations in uh, the provision of infrastructure, government limitations, market limitations, and as a result, co companies have to step in into basically solving some of the social needs. In um, advanced economies, because many of these public goods are provided by the government to some or we have specialized uh, suppliers. To some extent, the focus is more on the environmental side and basically reducing the negative externalities. So, so to some extent, there is, if you want, some level of separation, much more focus on the social side in emerging economies, much more focus on the environmental side in advanced economies. Yeah, I think I've had conversations with you about some of these uh, measures. You mentioned one time to me about Patrimonio Oi and how CEMEX uses that as a way to help uh, the lower income segment of the population in Mexico build uh, well-constructed homes, but of mm -hmm. course using CEMEX uh, yes. uh, uh, supplies. Uh, so what are some of the lessons that the multinationals in countries like the US or Europe 
uh, what are the lessons that these Im developed country multinationals can take from emerging market multinationals? I'd say two of them. Mm -hmm. And one of them is if you, if you want a reflection on historical understanding of the companies, another is what is happening. One of them is uh, to some extent take them seriously and not assume that their sources of advantage are basically based on location mm -hmm. advantages of their home country. We typically dismiss them that, well, yes, they are coming from emerging economies, they come from Brazil, they come from Thailand, they come from China. Well, it's just low labor costs, that's why they are good. Or it's just because the government is supporting them, or it's because they are not basically following high level environmental standards. This is to some extent a dismissive attitude and the notion that only because they come from emerging economies, they are good. Mm -hmm. The idea here, well, if you move to those countries, you should have access to the same location advantages. They are coming here. Maybe as an exporter, you can do this. Once you start moving out, it means that you're bringing something. Mm -hmm. It's not a location advantage anymore. Why are they good? They start analyzing their sources of advantage. Much of this is in the business model and process innovation. Oh, the products are very similar. It's just copycats. It's not the notion that they are going to be coming with new products. Some of them have. But many of the products are better made, made much more robustly, made cheaply, made more simply for a particular market that then in some cases is something that we appreciate in advanced economies. So the notion is instead of assuming that it's a location advantage, now you have to start looking at specific competitors. Why are they good? Start analyzing their business model. How do they basically interact? What are the resources? What are the processes? What is the business proposition, especially what is the customer value? Customer value. What are, how do they understand customers differently than how do we do it? And then the other thing is their processes. What do they do that we could do better? So that, yes, the highest tech is fantastic. But in many cases, it doesn't have to be the best highest tech. It is good enough technology that gets you good, reliable products at a lower price, that tends to be the way to basically conquer markets. So can you give me an example or two of this sort of multinational that uh, maybe has caught up and even uh, superseded uh, developed countries that you know, we can learn from? Um, superseded is a matter of opinion, yes. of course. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, uh, Marco Polo, uh, which is a big bus producer in, from Brazil, mm -hmm. Buses are not the highest tech products in the world. They are relatively simple. I mean, the technology is well established, but they have basically improved the production system so that they make them much more efficiently. And it is not, uh, well, you produce in Brazil, labor costs are lower, and therefore it's mm -hmm. going to be more cheaply done. It is not only just the labor costs, but it is also how you use them, how you assemble them, and they have taken this out and they have internationalized and they have produced elsewhere really reliable, robust buses that basically can run for a long time and can operate very well. The notion is high tech is fantastic, mm -hmm. but we are talking about if you want a pyramid of consumers, if you are only targeting the top of the pyramid, that is really good, but you are missing the much bigger middle and bottom of a pyramid, which are we like to have those really sophisticated products, cannot afford them, good enough is good, focus on the process, and ba from there basically take it. Huawei, which is now, if you want, one that to some extent has surpassed uh, some of the advanced economy companies, they started that way. Why don't we take mm -hmm. existing products, analyze how these are put together, can we do things better? Can we basically replace some parts for something that is simpler? It's not as sophisticated, but nevertheless, it is good enough. And from there, can we do it cheaply? And that's basically how they started initially. Yes, oh, they are copycats. No, there is innovation in trying to rethink products to make them faster and to make them cheaply and also to make them in a way that they are as reliable as the original products. And from there, yes, they invested mm -hmm. in technology and they have basically gone and produced right. really good products. Now, a lot of your examples are about manufacturing and industry. Are there similar uh, advances being made in the area of services? Mm -hmm. For example, digital strategy, digital platforms, 
in those kinds of industries, insurance perhaps, fintech, banking? Here, uh, if you look at platform, mm. uh, what is a platform dual-sided market in which you have a company connecting lots of uh, suppliers with lots of buyers? Right. Uh, that's pretty much the standard model of a platform. Like Amazon, for example. An Amazon, a Facebook, uh, well. an Apple to some extent. Mm -hmm. The idea here is that you are going to specialize. And this is what we teach in strategy. This is how we understand the mm -hmm. sco sources of competitive advantage. If you just do one thing, do it very well. So you are Facebook, you are basically social <laughs> Social network, if you are Google, initially was a uh, search, but well, they have expanded into other areas. Emerging market economies don't really think one thing do it well. We basically provide lots of services to lots of companies. So Gojek or Tencent they are basically one stop shop for all your digital needs. Initially, they were dismissed. Well, they are just copying uh, apps or services that we have in advanced economies. Gojek is coming from Indonesia. Well, they are just, uh, yes, right hailing. Isn't this easy? We all established this. They are just doing it. No, but they have gone from, yes, taking people around to delivering food, to providing financial services, to providing entertainment. So basically, they have expanded into the notion that, yes, once you have an understanding of your consumer, an understanding of how to match consumers with buyers, why don't we just offer everything? And the notion here is that a multitude of products, highly sophisticated, can solve the needs of people who are happy to basically just have one single super app, super app that dominates their life. And they are, on the one hand, really happy because it's super efficient. You are getting, yes, you can pay for things, you can get some credit, then you can get uh, some rewards from your uh, delivery, and you can use those rewards in something else. This is the notion that all of a sudden you go and expand and you do understand the consumer much better. And to some extent, what we see now in advanced economies, American uh, companies are realizing that, look, this notion of the super app is good, so why don't we just expand and rather than use do one thing very, really, really well, start offering other services. Why don't we get into payments? Why do we get into uh, services like entertainment, games? The notion is eventually, yes, we can end up copying those companies that we thought were the copycats of our initial model. So innovation is not restricted to advanced economies. It can come from everywhere. So the notion is start looking at those companies and start understanding the way they innovate, how, why they are good, rather than assume that, well, they are good, they copy, and they are just in emerging economies, and they rely, they rely on the location advantage for their uh, competitiveness. Fascinating, Alvaro. I think the, the conclusion that I would take away from all of this is uh, respect emerging market multinationals. They're getting better and better, and there's a lot to learn from them also. Great. So again, thank you very much, Alvaro. It's been a pleasure. And I hope all of you, our listeners, have enjoyed hearing from Alvaro, one of the world's experts on emerging market multinationals. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again in a future episode. If there's anything you would like us to cover, uh, do write to us. Thank you very much. Yeah.